Hi, and welcome to App Transformers More Than Meets the Eye. I'm Dana Price. I'm an app modernization architect with IBM, and um, I'm the host of this show. I'm glad that you joined us today. And I'm, we're joined by a special guest, Nicholas Heidloff, today, who's going to be telling me about and telling us about his experience having modernized end-to-end um, and at a legacy application and the steps he went through and the choices that he made and we'll get to dig into um, all the details. Nicholas, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Nicholas. I'm a developer advocate and I also work with our ecosystem of partners, especially in EMEA and making them successful using IBM technology and Red Hat, obviously. And yeah, today I want to talk about an example that I've implemented myself that shows how to modernize a complete application end to end. So that's why we call it step by step instructions. I want to guide you through the whole process. So I know this is a series and you have learned a lot of technologies already and topics. And I basically want to show how to bring all of those together in one comprehensive example that you can all try yourself. It's available as open source and right after this, you should be able just to play around with it and try it yourself. Yeah, and I was um, very pleased to be a part of your series. Um, so I want to draw attention to our home, which is the App Transformers homepage for our IBM Expert TV channel. And um, this is our, it looks like it's our 18th episode. Very wow. exciting. Um, we've, done, we've done some episodes that focus in on parts that Nicholas will um, share with us about his experience. So using Transformation Advisor, using Mono to Micro, some of the decisions that were made mm -hmm. in modernizing his application. But I encourage you to take a look at those. You can go back and, and watch those recordings and we love to get feedback. Um, so as you are taking part in today's session or in um, any of the future, if you're doing recordings, please do participate with us so that chat is open while we are recording and we're always glad to get your feedback. So please feel free to do so. And then Nicholas has um, his whole series. We'll include those in the chat so you can access his Git repository for his open source be able to access as well the recordings of his webinar series, which was really a fun thing to, to be a part of and to learn through. So I encourage you to do that and I'll include the links in the chat um, as we go. So Nicholas, please introduce us to your project and, and uh, show us what you were up to. Yeah, so exactly. So the, the first thing I would like to do is to show you a really short video, less than two minutes, and that video will explain why you should consider to modernize your applications. Elena, could we play the video, please? Hi, I'm Nicholas, an IBM developer advocate and part-time bunny keeper. Today, I'm going to explain the benefits of app modernization using rabbits. I got my kids two rabbits this spring. We put them in a simple cage and everything was just fine until we had a bunny explosion. A simple cage is like your monolithic app. It may be working fine until you have an explosion of requests and then you need to modernize. This was a catalyst for us to modernize the cage and replace it with a structure of several hutches and pathways. Let's look at this structure as a microservices application. These hutches are connected with pathways, just like loosely coupled microservices. My end users are having a much better and faster experience with this modernized structure. When I need to repair one of these hutches, the rabbits can continue moving around. And similarly for a microservices application, if you need to fix or extend one of your microservices, you can replace it while your application continues to run. In other words, you are more agile compared to monolithic architectures. The other benefit of app modernization is efficiency. All kits can feed the rabbits at the same time, which means we are done faster. And now I need to make sure that my end users are cleaning the hutches.
Okay, that was the video. Let me know. Start I love I love that video. It entertains me every single time, and it's a it it's such a nice representation of a different domain and the same concept. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so okay, so a short video with a lot of information, right? And this is basically just a summary. Why should you consider modernizing your applications? My number one reason is more agility. In other words, you want to be able to faster innovate, to, to, to make changes faster or improvements or fixes. And this is clearly something that cloud native capabilities provide for you. And then better user experiences and reduced costs are my number two and three reasons, which I explained only briefly in the video. But now let's talk, take a look at you know, different strategies, how you can modernize applications, or not only how to modernize applications, but in general, how to handle legacy applications. Because the first two don't really have anything to do with modernization. It's more about what to do with existing apps. Retire and don't touch. And the third one, lift and shift, is basically also rather, let's say, boring for me as a developer because it basically means you use an, you, you move an existing application, let's say, from a VM into the cloud, but you don't really gain any of the real cloud benefits. And that is the difference between cloud and cloud native. Cloud native means you want to leverage the benefits, the unique capabilities of the cloud compared to on-premises or rather classic architectures. And that's why in this talk today, I'm going to focus on number four and five, containerization and refactoring. And I'm going to show you how to do that because, again, that's what really gives you the most benefits. And that's also the most interesting part, um, parts, or those are the in most interesting parts for us as developers. So um, let me start by showing you the sample application um, right here. So the sample application that, that I'm using is a really simple e-commerce site. It's, you know, light, very, very simple form of um, Amazon, if you want, um, but obviously much um, simpler. Um, it, it's an application that it was available as open source, which was really important for me because, again, I wanted to also open source the end result. So I had to look for an application that was a couple of years old, in this case, 10 or 12 years, um, that I could then, you know, demonstrate how to move to a microservices-based architecture. So again, a really simple e-commerce application. And what you can do here is you can browse through the navigate uh, through the different categories right here. Let's say go back to movies. And then you can pick one of these items, let's say Star Wars. And 10 years ago, you wanted to do drag and drop in the web interface. So you can do that here. And this one has been added to your shopping cart. You can also see the same item here under order history. OK, so that's, again, really simple. But it shows many techniques that I think are key in, in the context of app modernization. Additionally, I implemented a new interface, which is this one. And this one doesn't really look much or any better, really. And that was really not my point. You know, I didn't want to make it really beautiful or anything. I just wanted to show you other techniques. And I will explain a little later how I've also used the concept of microservices in the front end, which are called micro front ends. OK, because it doesn't make sense to only use microservices in the back end, but then have one basically a bottleneck in the front end where you still have to coordinate between all the different teams if you want to make little changes. OK, but we will get back to that later on. So let me switch. Back and I did include in the chat a link to your repository okay, so cool. folks can access what you're demonstrating, be able to get access to the code, mm -hmm. your references, and your video. So, And also, um, I included a link to your webinar series where you, you dig much deeper into each of the concepts as you go through. Very good. Cool. Okay. OK, so now um, application modernization is a journey. Why do I say that? And what do I mean by saying that? Um, changing code that you implemented yesterday is difficult enough, as you probably all agree, right? Uh, it's a lot more difficult if you need to change code implemented by other people and maybe years, if not decades ago. So application modernization is not trivial. And you need to understand what you want to do, why you want to do it, what value it adds. 
and you should be careful. You know, my advice is take baby steps. You know, try to 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 make little steps where you understand what is going on, where you can measure the output, and you, whether you can actually see whether that change improved something. It also it reduces the risks, right? Because you can break much less if you do these little or if you take these little steps. So these are the steps that, that I took, um, 10 steps. And this process might look slightly different for you, but I think it's, it's a good representative example. So as I said, I started with this application from 2010, 2008 or something. Um, and it was implemented with Java EE 6. It was run on the WebSphere traditional server 855 in a virtual machine. That was my starting point. Now, in the next step, I then moved the application into a container, which I will talk about a little bit later. In the next step, step number three, I replaced WebSphere Additional with a more yeah, modern and more efficient runtime for especially for microservices running in containers called WebSphere Liberty. Step four is kind of obvious. You certainly want to separate your front end from the back end. That has always been the case, I, I guess. Step number five, I then moved from WebSphere Liberty to Open Liberty. Open Liberty is the open source version, the, the upstream version of WebSphere Liberty. And there are a couple of benefits and advantages. Um, one is you get changes and updates faster by using the open source version. There's a huge community um, where you get a lot of help. There's great uh, uh, tutorials and guides and everything. Um, and the license costs are also cheaper. Then uh, step num steps number six and seven are obviously related. And this is where I started to actually use microservices. So until step five, everything remained to be a monolith. And in and, and six and seven, I then started to move out certain functionality in a separate service. Step number eight is now the, uh, are now the micro front ends. So th this is basically using the concept of microservices in web applications. And number nine and 10 are also important because if all you do is to use microservices just for the sake of using microservices, that doesn't make any sense, right? I'm a big fan of, of microservices and cloud native, um, but if you don't do it right, you probably can save a lot of time by not doing anything. So number nine and 10 are key of this whole process, right? You need to think about how to automate things, how to do CI, CD, um, because if you don't do that, the whole benefits, you know, the number one reason that I talked about earlier, right, the more agility kind of breaks or it, it just doesn't happen if you don't have the automation in place as well. Okay, so let's take uh, a look at the original architecture. This is the version from 2008 or 10. And basically, you have two different virtual machines here, one running DB2 and the other one running both the, the front end and the back end in or on WebSphere and D or traditional at the time. So again, as I said, the first thing I did was to use the IBM Cloud Transformation Advisor. And today I won't go in much detail here. There have been other webinars before this, um, but essentially I used it to generate a Docker file. So you use this data collector, you run it on your WebSphere server, and then as output, it gives you basically what you see here, a couple of files or resources. Most important one is here in the lower left corner. It's the Docker file. And then there are you know, some other configuration files. And you know, for example, POM XML de defines your Java dependencies. Server XML is a configuration of the WebSphere server. And these are really, really great starting points. You know, a lot of you can save a lot of time by using these files to move really a full application into a container or into a container image. Yeah, so that's and just for folks that are watching this, that there is there are actually a couple of different episodes of App Transformers where we delve very deeply into how to use Transformation Advisor, the types of um, options you have when you're running your data collection, the way the way to get these results, and so. The streamlining of this to explain the end-to-end -end steps, if you want, you can go back and, and view those episodes to get more details. And also yeah. Niklas's webinar delves into that as well. Yeah, plus there's also some blog entries that I wrote. And when you go to the GitHub repo, you will find all of those. If you want, you can basically replay or redo all the things that I've done. There are step-by-step -step instructions as this webinar is titled, right? 
Um, and and you have all the intermediate steps as well, like you know all the different property files and 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 configuration files and everything is in the repo. So you can really ju just run everything. So you don't have to set up something in a VM just to run it. I have created another you know Docker image that kind of simulates WebSphere um, traditional running in a container, and then you can run this data collector in the image to get all the data. And again, everything is in the repo, so you can just try it out yourself. Fantastic. So the next um, step then is to move over to a more efficient runtime, for example, WebSphere Liberty, right? Which is much more efficient, especially for container um, workloads, um, because you can you know, define it on a more um, granular level in terms of what features you need, etc. And in order to do that, you do have to make a couple of code changes. I mean, not it's not dramatic, it, it's not too complicated, but this is a technology that has been around for what now, 15 years or so, and it's clear mm -hmm. that there have been some breaking changes. Not many. In fact, that's one of the advantages why you should stick with Java EE or now Jakarta EE, right? I mean, some people might not like that there isn't a lot of progress, but at the same time, you know, it keeps the applications really stable and you can update to a later Java or now Jakarta 9, for example, release, right? Um, without really breaking anything in, in most cases or maybe just minor things. And then you can use tools like the WebStream application migration toolkit, which can help you to actually do these changes. And again, there has been another webinar, so I just want to you know, mention it on a high level. So you run this tool in Eclipse, in your Eclipse IDE, and then you define, for example, I want to upgrade from WebSphere traditional 8.5 to Liberty, from EE6 to EE8, uh, from Java 6 to Java 8. And as a result, you get this output view or these two views, the help view and the output view. And it shows you all the places in the code which you have to, to change or which, which you might want to change um, optionally, right? And in this case, what you see here is that um, an old package was used, which was probably not available at the time in Java EE, but is now available in Java EE or Jakarta EE. So the, the proposal here is to update to a library that is available in Jakarta so that you don't, so that you basically have one dependency less. Okay. And again, very easy. In the easiest case, you can do a quick fix kind of functionality here, right click and quick fix if possible, and a, a huge help, a huge help. Yeah. And um, like you mentioned, we do have as well other webinars, um, both in, in your series as well as in the expert TV, yeah, yeah. where Cindy has walked us through using. Um, Webster Application Migration Toolkit. And you brought up something in there that I, I like to call out is that the specification level changes and the features that are used, Transformation Advisor will create the configuration for you and make that much faster. But in addition, Liberty allows for zero migration. Even though the specification levels continue to grow, the feature set that you're using, unless you choose to modify your application to use new features available, your your application can continue running in Liberty ad infinitum. So it's um, definitely a great step. And I love your strategy of step by step, change one thing at a time. We like to call them the baby steps. That the idea is not only do you tackle a problem and you solve it, but if there are any issues, you you can identify it was within this small realm rather than I just changed everything all at one time and what yep. the heck went wrong. Um, and then the, the idea of that step-by-step -step changes allows you also to create your best practices that will you'll use. And I know you talk about at the end your automation, but you can use them throughout your modernization with future applications as well. So it's really an, a nice pattern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if, if you do these things for the first time, you know, some of these changes might be a little bit harder, right? Because you don't only have to understand, you know, the new way to write code, but you also have to understand how it was implemented like 10 years ago. Um, but, but if you have done it for one application, it's very likely that you will see the same patterns in other applications, um, mm -hmm. which means you can do these modernizations then much faster. You know, when, once you, for example, JPA is something that, you know, um, cost me some trouble, let's say, right? Because there were some breaking changes in between versions. 
Um, but but if 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 you understand these changes once, um, you know, for future application modernizations, the process will be much simpler. And I, I and for enterprises that are tackling a large set of application, hundreds or thousands of applications, I highly recommend that they create a core set of folks that will have this institutional knowledge about what what was found, what the choices were, what the best options were for their enterprise, and it could be resources for other developers who are going through that. So in essence, creating a, a center of excellence for your modernization steps and choices. So, very nice. Yeah, exactly. OK, so uh, moving forward. So the next step then is to update to um, Open Liberty. And I already mentioned that you know, there are a couple of advantages. You know, you, you get the fixes faster. There's this big community around it and so forth. And just to reiterate what I said, right, um, the, the big advantage, advantage of using Java EE or Jakarta EE is the upwards compatibility. And, and that I think is, is the number, <laughs> is, is, is a really good reason to, 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 to stick with Java EE, right? Especially when, when you want to update the, these old, um, you know, applications. Um, it's it's much simpler than moving on to another framework or something, right? So if if you are happy with your Java applications, how you built them ten years ago, it's it's rather simple to just update to, you know, a more modern, more lightweight, more efficient Java runtime, and then together with Jakarta EE, the modernization process is pretty straightforward. So having said that, um, you know, as, as you can tell, uh, maybe um, from listening to, to me talking, um, I'm a big fan of microservices and cloud native architectures. At the same time, I realized that, you know, they are not the right solution for every problem. And in, or in other words, monoliths are not always evil. You know, to be very clear, there are good reasons why you might want to stick with your existing monoliths or why you might even want to um, implement new applications as monoliths. Like I, I worked with a partner recently and they had this architecture diagram with 10 microservices. And after some discussions, it turned out it, it wasn't really more like then, you know, maybe, you know, one to two developers working on it for like one or two months. In that case, you know, you would have a lot of overhead using microservices and cloud native capabilities. Or another reason are transactions. If, if you really need transactions between microservices, yes, it's possible, but it's not simple, it's not straightforward, and they are not really standards yet. Um, so again, there, there are good reasons why you might not want to use cloud native capabilities. On the flip side, though, there are good reasons. And, and you know, the scenario that I'm going to use today is you know, if, if you are a user of this e-commerce site, then most of these users, or most of the times you visit that site, you only want to browse for, for, for items, for products, and you want to check the prices. And only in few cases, you actually start an ordering process. And that's kind of typical for all users, obviously, right? So I would guess then that in an e-commerce site, 80% of the, the users only use the catalog and nothing else. So here it makes a lot of sense to really use what is called the Strangler pattern to basically externalize one key component in a separate microservice, which in this case is the catalog service. And the reason why this makes sense is you can then scale the services separately. You can say, okay, if four times more people only use the catalog, then you know, just use four times you know, as many instances compared to, to the monolith or the remaining monolith. And that's basically what the Strangler pattern says. It says, you know, don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to break your whole system down in too many microservices at the same time. Again, take baby steps. You know, identify the most promising microservice once uh, first. You know, start with it. Learn. You know, collect experiences and and you know, make sure you actually added value and actually these changes made sense. So yeah, that's why I like. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to jump in there that, that that combines with your last statement about a monolith. There are some cases where technology or um, geographical location of a particular part of your application might need to stay in yeah. its on-premise deployment and your, your strangler pattern lets you 
pull out the parts that would benefit from the additional services you have in the cloud. So your first slide where you said, have a good reason to modernize, you know, that that, that allows you with the strangler pattern is really ideal. It allows you to take the part of your application that you want to extend, that you want to rewrite, that you want to scale independently and leave the rest of it where it is. Exactly. Yep. Very nice. So the question is, how do you identify your first um, microservices that you want to strangle out? And there's a couple of different ways. You know, some developers might want to use their intuition, you know, simply because they understand the system or the application. Um, and it might, it might make sense for them. Um, other people might want to use domain-driven design, which is also a valid um, alternative. What I've used here is a tool which is called IBM Monitor Micro. And again, there have been other um, webinars about yeah. that as well. So, and, and I don't want to go again in too much detail. So let's ignore everything here on the left-hand side. Let's focus on these two rectangles here, the one with the green and the purple dots, because this basically tells you that it makes sense to strangle out the catalog functionality here in this one microservice, the, the purple rectangle. Right, and everything else, the green dots here, they are basically the remaining monolith. They, you know, remain to be part of, of you know, one code base and, and one um, deployable unit. And, you know, this is basically exactly what I had in mind, but, but the tool helped me. And it might not make sense to use that tool if you have an application that is that simple as, as my sample here. But imagine you don't only have like these, I don't know how many call classes do I have, 30 or so. Imagine you have, you know, 3,000. In that case, I think the tool, you know, helps you a lot to understand the, the code base much better, right? Without going through every um, class yourself, checking dependencies. Also, the other nice thing here is that this is not only static code analysis, but, you know, they, they also, or the tool also interprets the use cases, the, the, invocation, the chains of invocations between classes and methods at runtime. So that mm -hmm. there's you know a way where you can basically say, hey, start use case, and then you run the web application, you 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 know, you click through a flow or a process of you know a use case, and then you say end, right? And this is basically then also the dynamic component of it. So in anyway, so lots of cool things in, in this tool here. Um, you should really try it out. Again, if you want to try it out for this particular sample, there's step-by-step -step instructions. Um, there's all the data in the different stages, and you can take a look. Even without running it, you can just you know, look at look at the data if you like. Yeah, but we did have we did have a um, app transformers episode on that, and um, it, at, on the Monitor Micro's homepage, there is an interactive demo where you can see it in action for yourself with some different sample data. Nick Glasses has um, project has his data about his test case execution, so we use AI in order to interpret and cluster together the activities that should be logically um, partitioned in the same um, microservice or, or mm -hmm. partition. So it's, yeah, definitely take a look at that. Yep. Okay, so, so the other thing that I wanna point out here is that, you know, what, what, what is key here when you identify microservices, right, is that you really want to minimize the dependencies between these different microservices or they are called here petitions because AI is used and there's some clustering going on here. So you really want to minimize the two, these two lines as an example, right? In the best case, there are no dependencies, um, but, but in reality, mostly you have dependencies. And you know, one you know, anti-pattern is to use synchronous REST API calls because then very, quickly you start building distributed monoliths. Like, you know, imagine you have this monolith with SQL queries and all running, you know, in one process, which can be very efficient. If all you do is basically to break down the whole system in microservices, and then you basically have all the, the relations between the tables, not between the tables, but between the microservices and the network, um, that won't help you. And in fact, it, it will, you know, damage the performance and and the you know the whole complexity of your application. So don't do that. You know. <laughs> yes. Whatever you, I mean, you should not build. You must not build microservices for the sake of building microservices and because people think it's cool or whatever. Um, 
but really make sure you understand the benefits. And in one way to really um, minimize the dependencies is to use event-driven architectures. So again, the goal should not be to have microservices, but to have to decouple different systems or modules or call them microservices, whatever. Make sure you, you can, you know, you have loosely coupled components, let's say, right? And event-driven architectures really help you to do that. And, yeah. and here's what I've done. Um, so again, I've used the Strangler pattern and we also, we, we still have the remaining monolith, but we also have now this catalog service here, right? The second box, the second blue box. The second one uses another database. You really want to separate the different data, uh, the, the different data from, from each other. And there are no dependencies. There are no lines between the two boxes here, which is really key. Instead, Kafka is used for asynchronous communication. And, you know, there are a couple of advantages. One is the decoupling. Um, the other one is, you know, if you use these reactive technologies, you know, you will save a lot of resources. You know, using reactive technologies is much more efficient than using, you know, anything, let's say, imperative or, you know, synchronous calls. And I have a completely separate talk about it. Again, we don't have too much time today, but I wanted to show you, um, you know, these, these results. So this is Apache, how's it called? JMeter, right? I forgot. So what, what I did was I implemented the same endpoint, the same REST API, if you want, twice. Um, once using reactive capabilities and once using synchronous capabilities. Um, and all I do is I have one microservice and one CRUD operation going against the database, I think Postgres, doesn't really matter. Um, and in one case, again, I use reactive capabilities, the, the whole chain down to the, to the database. Um, and in the other case, just the classic, you know, synchronous um, capabilities. And uh, then I simulated 30,000 requests by 150 users. And you can see the differences here just in terms of time or duration um, are, are really big, you know, 45 seconds compared to one minute 18. And this doesn't tell you anything about CPUs and memory, but, you know, you can, you can clearly see that these capabilities are much more efficient, especially if you use technologies like Quarkus or Vertex, um, which come basically with this reactive engine built in. Um, really cool capabilities. And, and this is really what you should keep in mind when you build microservices these days. Yeah, and last, our last um, episode of App Transformers was actually on reactive flow pipelines. So mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome to see these patterns that independent folks have been working through and we come to the same best practices. Yeah for our um, inter-process or inter-service communication. It's really nice. Yeah, exactly, because I should have mentioned that because you know the, the key with reactive capabilities is that you don't block the UI thread, right? But, but you use multiple threads and, and there, there's no blocking. As soon as something is done, you know, it goes back. Um, the, the, you, know, you, you don't block the IO traffic. That's, that's really the key. Yeah. Um, and then that's that's the reason why, and this is so it's not magic, but there's actually a good reason, right? Which I just explained. So um, take a look into it. It it does take some time if you haven't used reactive capabilities. There's some learning curve, to be honest. But you know, once you have done it once, um, you know, you, you you won't miss these capabilities. So now the next um, topic is or are micro front ends, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning, right? If if all you do is to have multiple databases and microservices. Um, you don't really gain that much because you still have a bottleneck, which is the web application. Uh, let, let's let's think about a scenario. Let's let's say you want to extend a rating, um, you know, some stars to your products in your um, e-commerce site. That means you have to um, modify the database, the backend microservice, and also the web application. Okay, if if you only have one web application, you still have to coordinate with all other front end developers, with all other teams, and make sure you don't break anything, and you know you don't. There are no conflicts. So what I suggest is to use the same concept as microservices in the back end, also for front ends, and that's again exactly what is called micro front ends. So what I've done here, and maybe I've gone a little bit overboard here. I, I broke down the front end not in two but in six. Okay, and uh, again, it's just to illustrate that it's actually possible. Um, and I've used here a framework which is called Single Spar, um, but there's also many other ones that you can use. And, and the trick here or the concept is that it pulls together the different parts in the front end. Okay, so it can say, so there's this one shell component, which is kind of the entry point, 
and the shell component says, hey, I need these other five micro front ends, then, then they are pulled in. And you can say, I want them from a remote server or I want them from my local server, my local development machine. And um, you, know, you have really clean separation. Again, it's all about decoupling, right? And this is what you achieve here. Um, and, and maybe this um, illustration makes it a little bit more, uh, more clearer what I've done here. So there are two components that are invisible. One is the shell component that I mentioned. The other one is a messaging component using reactive JavaScript. And this is basically exactly the same thing as Kafka in the backend. So you want to have the decoupling. You don't want to do synchronous calls between those JavaScript components. But instead, again, you use as much messaging as you want. And, and then things maybe like command patterns, if you also require an output and stuff like that. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the different visual, um, the four visual um, components that are um, put here on, on the web page. And for the implementation of these different visual um, um, components, you can use whatever framework you like. I've used Vue.js because I'm a big fan of Vue.js, of the programming model. You can also use React or Angular or Web Components or vanilla JavaScript. It's really up to you. Um, and, and that's really a nice thing because, again, now if you want to add ratings to the UI, you only need to touch the catalog micro front end and nothing else. So um, that's almost everything that I wanted to show today. Yeah. But I wanted to show you also how it looks like um, once it's actually deployed. So first of all, this is the GitHub repo. OK, so please check it out. And if you like it, please uh, give me some stars. Um, and it's, it's pretty comprehensive, right? So there's a lot of documentation in there. So again, these are the 10 steps. There are some videos and recordings from webinars. Um, I've implemented, um, I've written 40 different block entries about it, right? Which you can see all here. Again, they all contain these step-by-step -step instructions for the different parts. And um, there are different ways to deploy it. You know, you might want to use just Docker Desktop if you don't have a Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster, which I don't recommend, but you know, it might be a good or easy start. Um, all you need to do is basically clone the repo and run, uh, run one single command. Um, but if you have OpenShift, for example, right, the enterprise distribution of Kubernetes, then you know just go ahead. <clears throat> All you need to do is install the Tecton operator, what's well, called pipelines operator, right? Um, yeah, and um, and then again run these commands. You know the first one deploys DB2. Um, then Kafka and Postgres, they're all deployed in the cluster for development purposes. Now, in reality, you might want to think about whether that makes sense or whether you rather want to use a managed service, which we also provide in the IBM cloud, obviously, um, which, which certainly makes your life easier. Um, and then deploy application. This is really where um, all the pipelines I created, the Tecton pipelines for your CI CD. Okay, and I can show you this right here. So these are the pipelines. And now the nice thing is that for all of my micro front ends, for all of my microservices, I have separate pipelines. Okay. And <clears throat> you can run them completely separately from each other. And as you can see, I did it this morning here for testing purposes. And once you have done that, you can see your workloads here under pods. And I need to switch to what was the name? Um, yeah, this one, App Mode Tech Term Dev and status running completed um, and then you can see again you know each pipeline basically created one pot or you know basically one container in this case um, and then you get all the benefits right as i said if there's something wrong for example this one has actually a memory leak i noticed this morning right 890 megabyte are too much um, so you could, could um, you know define some restrictions that that doesn't happen or you just go ahead manually and say delete pot and without any yeah. And without any further um, you know, action, it, it's, it's starting a new one right away, um, which requires then only 170 megabyte, right? So the, those are some of the advantages here. And there's much more, obviously, right? And reasons why you really want to use OpenShift. But again, I, I really encourage you to, to take a look. Um, you know, in terms of deployment, one last comment I wanted to make here is that there's also um, an example that shows how to use Tecton in, this, in addition to Argo CD. Argo CD is a GitOps tool. Um, there's another operator for OpenShift. And this is really cool, right? Essentially, you, you use a, a Git repo to say, OK, this is my to be state. You know, This is what I want to do. I want to deploy, let's say, the latest version of my container image or something. 
And then Argo CD can basically synchronize everything automatically for you between your cluster, between different namespaces, let's say one for development, one for production and, and testing and so forth. Um, with with the uh, information in the GitHub repo, so very cool. Um, it's also part of of, um, of the instructions here, and there are also instructions if you want to run the original monolith using Web Liberty traditional, um, you know, or the old eGem beans which I replaced. You know, it's all documented, um, and you can basically try everything that I talked about today yourself and more. Yeah, um, compliments, Nicholas. As always, it's it's been wonderful sharing your experience. We, I, I know that Nicholas and I work together, and um, I, I pick his brain about why did you choose this? What were your options? What other things could we do? So it's nice to see your experience end to end, and and your thought processes around it. So your considerations and. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. It was wonderful. And thank you as well for um, folks that were um, following along with us. I do encourage you, head out to that Git repo, take a look at what Nicholas um, has documented for us and, and see how he has tackled modernization step-by-step step and where that might fit for you. And if you have any other questions, join us for future episodes. And um, thank you all for your time. Thanks, Nicholas. Bye, everyone. Bye.